Well, good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Are we good? Are we good? It's been a beautiful couple of days. Some sunshine. Uh, I have to say, I got to thank Scotty right away. I had quite a few things going on this week. I had two gravesides and a memorial service, and I said, Scotty, please, please, can you help me out? Can you preach? He said, yes, I can do that. So thank you, Scotty, for that reprieve, because it was a busy week. Um, also, uh, if you didn't know, we sent off 10 high schoolers this morning to uh, do a mission trip to Portland, Oregon. Uh, we were there. We prayed them out. Uh, they're very excited. Um, so just as a church, please be praying for them on this trip. Pray for safety. Pray that they would have a wonderful experience, that they would encounter God in a new way, that they would build close relationships. So just be in prayer for them and their families. Um, and mark on your calendars, July 10th, we will have a mission recap where several of the kids will share stories with us. So that will be very exciting to see that. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, I think it's time for some fun video announcements. Yeah, let's roll it. Welcome to CLC. We are so glad that you are here with us today. If you are new with us, I would like to encourage you to visit our Welcome Center and pick up a free gift there that we have for you. If it's your first Sunday with us, you can fill out the connection card that's in your bulletin and turn it into the overflowing cup for a free latte. For those online, we have an online connection card available on our homepage. Just click on the Welcome tab at the top and hit Start. There are many ways to find out what's happening here at CLC through our weekly email, on our website, in the bulletin, and on our church app. Or feel free to call the church office at any time to get caught up on all of the events. We are a praying church and we want to pray for you. On the connection card, on the website, and on the app, there's a place for you to submit your prayer requests. We pray as a staff for those requests during the week, so please let us pray for you. There are many ways to worship the Lord through giving here at CLC. We have the offering box in the back of the sanctuary. You can drop off your check during the week, and you can give securely online through our giving platform. The best way to give is through our new church app because it's the most secure way to give, and you can set up reoccurring gifts and notifications. Mark your calendar. We have a family-friendly all-church barbecue planned every month during the summer, starting June 29th from 6 to 8 p.m. at CLC, July 20th from 6 to 8 at the Bennett's home on Bay Point, and finally August 17th from 6 to 8 back at CLC. Bring a side dish, a lawn chair, and a friend. CLC, I want to tell you about a story right now. A story about a pastor who desperately wants to get to know the people he serves. But when he goes to the directory, do you know what he sees? He sees this. That isn't, that isn't what he wants to see. He wants to see you all of your beautiful faces so that he can connect names and faces so he can care for you. So CLC, if you have it within your heart, deep within your heart, if you would take the opportunity to come to this bench, this area at some point after service and get your picture taken, you will help this pastor get to know you more and to love on you. And I will be happy. My joy will be complete as we learn in Philippians during this series. So thank you for listening to my plea and supporting this cause. Oh. So I don't know why this is an appropriate time for confession, but would you stand? <laughs> <laughs> and Amber's gonna lead us in confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done.
say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But as we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, forgives all of our sins and cleanses us from our unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. All right, well, we're going to worship the Lord singing, God So Loved. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink from the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. God so loved, for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us, whoever believes in him will live forever. is waiting there with open arms see his open arms for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever the power For God so loved, God so loved the world. Let's hear the ladies sing this part. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Come on, come on man. Praise God. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love, His amazing love. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated, now it is well. I'm walking in freedom, for God so loved, God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the Fails me all my days. 
moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so.
Pastor Dylan. Uh, all right. Thank you for joining me this morning. Have you guys ever been in a race? Yeah? Cross country. Wow. Fantastic. Well, good. Well, I bet most of us have been in a race at one time. And the Philippians passage that we're going to read today does say something about, Paul tells us about a race that we're going to run. And we're going to run that race for God. And Jesus is going to be our coach. And so we are going to go out into the world and tell them how much we, how much Jesus loves all the people that we see and get to know, right? And, well, he even says that there's a prize for this race. And Paul says that the prize to which we're running is to gain, uh, God called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So we are going to win the prize of heaven. Well, the, the, I don't know about you, but when I win a prize, I want to tell everybody about it, right? I want to show everybody the prize. So we get to do that through telling about Jesus. But the Bible says our citizenship is actually in heaven. So what is citizenship? Well, I brought my passport to show you a little bit about citizenship. I was born in the United States of America, and I am a citizen of the United States. See, it's got my picture, it's got my name, and it says that I'm a citizen. So if I go to a foreign country, and I give, they say, where are you from? I give them this passport, and they say, oh, you're from the United States. And then I come home, and they say, where are you from? And I give them this passport, and they say, welcome home. So I am a citizen of the United States, and this home, this is my home on Earth. But did you know that the moment that you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that God writes your name in a special book. It's called Book of Life. And in that book, it might even have your picture. It definitely has your name. And so while we're on this, and, and that's like my new passport, right? That's my internal passport. So while I'm on earth, I'm gonna run the race and we're gonna tell everybody we know that Jesus loves them and he wants to know them. And so we invite them to Sunday school and to church to get to know him. And when we're done living on this earth, God himself is going to say, my child, welcome home. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these children and the big children in the audience online and on the radio. If anyone doesn't know you, please speak to their hearts today so they can run this beautiful race with us, giving out your word and your promises that only Jesus can fulfill. And so that when we reach the end of this life, the gates of heaven will open up and we'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant, welcome home. All right. And all children said? Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can go back. And everybody can get up and, and greet everybody. scripture lesson this morning from the book of Philippians, Ooh, thank you, from the book of Philippians 
chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. Thank you, Jeff. Well, um, this mic seems really, really loud. <laughs> I'm not used to being up here and hearing it. <laughs> I'm used to being over there and hearing it. Um, <laughs> so um, that is part of our passage today. We're going to be studying uh, Philippians chapter 3, the entire um, chapter. But I think context is really important. One of the things that we haven't really done yet is uh, do an overview of the book of Philippians. And when I uh, did and have done many different Bible studies, my favorite Bible study style is inductive Bible study. Who have you, who's done an inductive Bible study before? So that is the who, what, why, where, and when of Bible studies, where it's uh, who wrote it, who it was written to, when was it written, Lord, uh, um, what was happening in that time in history, and so on. Context, context, context. So we're going to, for all the visual learners, we're going to watch a video for just a short while to kind of get an overview of the book of Philippians. So join me in watching this. Paul's letter to the Philippians. The church in Philippi was the first Jesus community Paul started in Eastern Europe, and that story is told in Acts chapter 16. Philippi was a Roman colony in ancient Macedonia. It was full of retired soldiers, and it was known for its patriotic nationalism. And so there Paul faced resistance when he was announcing Jesus as the true king of the world. And after Paul moved on from there, those who became followers of Jesus continued to suffer resistance and even persecution. But they remained a vibrant community faithful to the way of Jesus. Paul sent this letter from one of his many imprisonments, and for a very practical reason. The Philippians had sent one of their members, Epaphroditus, to take a financial gift to Paul to support him in prison. And Paul sent back this letter with Epaphroditus to say thank you and to do a whole lot more. The design of this letter doesn't develop one single idea from beginning to end like many of Paul's other letters. Rather, Paul has arranged a series of short, reflective essays or vignettes, and they all revolve around the center of gravity in this letter, which is a poem in chapter 2. It artistically retells the story of the Messiah's incarnation, his life, death, and resurrection, and exaltation. And then in each of these vignettes, Paul will take up key words or ideas from that poem to show how living as a Christian means seeing your own story as a lived expression of Jesus' story. So Paul opens the letter with a prayer of gratefulness, and he thanks God for the Philippians' generosity, for their faithfulness, and he expresses his confidence that the life-transforming work that God has begun in them will continue into greater and more beautiful expressions of faithfulness and love. And Paul then focuses on their obvious concern at the moment, which is his status in prison. Being in a Roman prison was no picnic, but it paradoxically has turned out for good to advance the good news about Jesus. So all of the Roman guards, the administrators, they all know that Paul's in prison for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And his imprisonment, it's inspired confidence in other Christians to talk about Jesus more openly. And Paul's optimistic that he will be released from prison, but it's possible that he could be executed. And as he reflects on it, that actually wouldn't be so bad, because for me, Paul says, life is the Messiah. And so dying would be a gain. For Paul, his life in the present and in the future, it's defined by the life and love of Jesus for him. And so if he's executed, that means he'll be present with Jesus, which would be great for him. And if he's released, well, that would mean he could keep working to start more Jesus communities, which would be better for other people. And so that's what he hopes for. And notice how his train of thought works here. Dying for Jesus is not the true sacrifice for Paul. Rather, it's staying alive to serve others. And so that's Paul's way of participating in the story of Jesus, to suffer in order to love others more than himself. Paul then turns to the Philippians, and he urges them to participate in Jesus' example by taking up this same mindset. 
He says, your life as citizens should be consistent with the good news about the Messiah. So these Christians, Philippi, they were living in a hotbed of Roman patriotism. But their way of life was to be shaped by another king, Jesus. And that might bring persecution. But they are not to be afraid because suffering for being associated with Jesus, it's a way of living out the story of Jesus himself. Which leads Paul into the great poem of chapter 2. It's rich with echoes of Old Testament texts, specifically the story of Adam and his rebellion in Genesis 1 through 3, and the poems about the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. This poem is worth committing to memory. It is a beautifully condensed version of the gospel story. So before becoming human, the Messiah pre-existed in a state of glory and equality with God. And unlike Adam, who tried to seize equality with God, the Messiah chose not to exploit his equal status for his self-advantage. Rather, he emptied himself of status. He became a human. He became a servant to all. And even more than that, he allowed himself to be humiliated. He was obedient to the Father by going to his death on a Roman execution rack. But through God's power and grace, the Messiah's shameful death has been reversed through the resurrection. And now God has highly exalted Jesus as the king of all, bestowing upon him the name that is above all names, so that all creation should recognize that Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that last statement is astounding. Paul's quoting from Isaiah chapter 45. It's a passage where all creation comes to recognize the God of Israel as Lord. Paul's point here is very clear. In the crucified and risen Jesus, we discover that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Lord Jesus. And so for Paul, this poem, it expresses his convictions about who Jesus is, and it does more. It offers the example of Jesus as a way of life that his followers are to imitate. And so that's why Paul immediately goes on to tell two stories, first about Timothy, then about Epaphroditus, because they are both examples of people living out Jesus' story. So Timothy is like Jesus because he's constantly concerned for the well-being of other people more than his own. And Epaphroditus, who the Philippians sent with their gift, he ended up risking his life to serve Paul in prison. He got so sick he almost died trying to help Paul. But God had mercy on him and Paul by sparing him the loss of a friend. Paul's the story of Jesus, and they are worthy of imitation. Paul then turns to his own story as an example. So those Christians who had been demanding circumcision of non-Jewish Christians, remember his letter to the Galatians, these people are still stirring up trouble for Paul, and they keep reminding him of his own past. When he used to persecute Jesus' followers, when he tried to show his right standing before God by his zealous obedience to the laws of the Torah. But like Jesus, Paul has given up all of that status and privilege. He now regards all of it as filth. And the word he uses is actually much less polite. He's given it all up to become a servant, like Jesus, to participate in his suffering and sacrificial love. And he does all of it in the hope that Jesus' love will carry him through death and out the other side into resurrection. So Paul says that for followers of Jesus, their true citizenship is in heaven, which for Paul does not mean that we should all hope to get away from earth and go to heaven one day. Rather, heaven is the transcendent place where Jesus reigns as king. And he says we're eagerly awaiting our royal savior to come from there and return here to bring his kingdom of healing justice and transforming love to bring about a new creation. He challenges the Philippians to keep living out the Jesus story. He first addresses two prominent women leaders in the church who worked alongside Paul, and they're in some kind of conflict. And so Paul pleads with them to follow Jesus' example of humility, to reconcile and become unified. Paul then urges the Philippians not to give in to fear, but despite their persecution, to vent all of their emotion and their needs to God who will give them peace. And that peace, Paul says, it comes by focusing your thoughts on what is good and true and lovely. There's always something that you could complain about, but a follower of Jesus knows that all of life is a gift and can choose to see beauty and grace in any life circumstance. Which leads Paul to his conclusion. He again thanks the Philippians for their sacrificial gift, and he wants them to know that his imprisonments, that his times of poverty, that these are not true hardships for him. They've actually become his greatest teachers, 
showing him that no matter his circumstances, he has learned the secret of contentment. It's simple dependence on the one who strengthens him. Paul has come to see his own suffering as a participation in the story of Jesus. The letter to the Philippians gives us a unique window into Paul's own heart and mind. He saw his entire life as a reenactment of the story of Jesus. And you can sense in this letter his close connection to Jesus, his awareness that Jesus' love and presence is closer than his own skin. And that's what gave him hope and humility in his darkest hours. And so Paul shows us that knowing Jesus is always a deeply personal, transforming encounter. And that's the kind of Jesus that Paul invites others to follow. And that's what Paul's letter to the Philippians is all about. So that's, that's a great overview. I just love that. <clears throat> Getting the whole big picture of that book. And uh, to follow Dylan's uh, kind of outline of his sermon, I'm going to go ahead and have a big idea just like he has. So that here's the big idea of this sermon. Knowing Jesus personally is more important than pedigree, performance, or perfection. So let's read uh, Philippians 3, 1 through 6. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me and is a protection for you. Watch out for dogs. Watch out for evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who serve by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. I'm going to pause here. Again, just a reminder, uh, Paul already talks about this in Galatians, uh, where the circumcision group has gotten together. There's a group of Jews that want the Gentiles to be more Jewish and to follow the law, but uh, Paul puts a kibosh to that in verse 2, 21b. He says this, For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. End of story. That kind of puts a pin in that one. Verse 4, Although I once also had confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh... I have more, he says. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee. Regarding zeal, persecuting the church. Regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. Those are big words. <laughs> so point one. Growing up in the church and having a lot of Bible knowledge does not equate to knowing God more. I grew up in the church. My dad was an elder. My mom sang in the choir. We practically lived at our church growing up. My parents ran a Christian mission organization. I went to private Christian school for a while. I went into missions directly out of high school and traveled over 20 countries sharing the gospel. I did a School of Biblical Studies in 1991 and became ordained as a minister in 2013. But are any of those statistics about my past really important in defining my relationship with Jesus? That's the question. Can you imagine what it was like for Paul as a young boy? Of course, he was named Saul back then. He didn't become Paul until after his conversion. As a Jewish boy growing up in those days, um, historians say that there was an immense pressure for boys to be chosen by a rabbi and to become a student of the law of Moses and eventually a teacher. If they were not chosen, they were to take a lesser job in the community. So there was this massive social pressure placed on young men at that time. But Paul talks about this in verse 5 and 6. First of all, pedigree. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. And number two, performance. Regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church. So we got pedigree, performance, and now perfection. Regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. So we got pedigree, performance, and perfection. But what does he say? By all standards, 
he should be held in the highest regard because of he's done all of these things. But then verse 7 and 8 happen. So let's read on. Philippians 3, 7 through 11. And we already heard 7 and 8, but I'll read it again. But everything that was a gain to me, I've considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth. And many other words that have been translated there. So that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own from the law but one that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Point number two. Relationship with Jesus is our gain. It's very obvious. He says in verse eight, I also consider everything to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He states his singular goal in verse 10 is to know him. He says, my goal is to know him. Here's a guy that studied his entire life that considers that nothing, I repeat, nothing is more important than knowing him. He's known all about him, but now knowing him is way more important. Paul had this unique experience with Christ, of course, in the book of Acts. It describes how Paul was on the road to Damascus, and many of you know this story when the Lord confronted him, and he had his serious come-to-Jesus moment. He became a believer that day, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, his mind was transformed and he understood the things he had learned as a child and how the Torah predicted the coming of Jesus. Um, the prophets had, had predicted it, and he understood it. Paul was able to preach the gospel or the story of Jesus effectively because he had so much knowledge. But the Holy Spirit brought revelation to that knowledge. The revelation that led to Paul spending time in prayer with Jesus, developing a relationship with him, and that is the relationship that he's speaking of right there in that passage. So let's continue to read. Philippians 3, 12 through 21. Here's verse 12. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already full, fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, all who are mature should think this way, and if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. Join in imitating me, brothers. This is an ongoing theme throughout Philippians. Join in imitating me. Be disciples. Follow the rabbi. Do what the rabbi does. Say what the rabbi says. Jesus is our rabbi. And imitate me, brothers, and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. They are focused on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. It's not going to be in heaven. It is in heaven right now from the day that you became a believer from which we so eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything 
to himself. So what is Paul saying here? In a nutshell, he's saying, you know me. You know I listen to God. There are others that want to bring you down and control you, but listen to your heart. Listen to God. Have a relationship with him, and he will show you that these words are true. It's a very simple concept, and I'm not telling you a lot of things that you don't already know, but it's always great to be reminded of these things, that we can have all this vast knowledge, but unless we're spending time listening to his voice and hearing his voice and having a conversation with him, do we truly know him? We may know about him. And Paul was fortunate that he got to meet him face to face. But my encouragement to you, obviously, is to know him, to hear his voice, that still small voice, and be able to hear him softly speak to you. Because every word that he says is encouraging and lovely and will change your life forever. Point number three is loving others well keeps us humble. So this part, the short little part, is my opinion. It's nobody else's opinion. Hasn't been approved by anybody else as, on, on, as far as opinions are concerned. But I'm going to just throw it out there anyway. I think maybe somebody may agree. Who knows? The church in America has bought into the lie that they need to be better than other churches around them. They compare themselves with other churches. How many people are in the congregation? What kind of music do they have at this church? What kind of music do they have at this church? How are they doing on social media? You know, what's, how's Twitter going? How's your Facebook feed? How many numbers do you have here and numbers there? And we move towards more of a corporate branded church in America. So we put stickers on our cars for the churches that we attend and we become in competition with one another instead of being in a place of unity. Paul, in this uh, book of Philippians, faces nationalism in Philippi. And of course, that video talks about the nationalism quite a bit. They were proud of themselves. They were proud of their pedigree, their performance, and their perfectionism. But Paul, in this letter is warning them and pleading them with them to leave that all behind. He gives the personal example of his own life. He implores them to count that all as rubbish, but to value over every single thing relationship with Jesus Christ because he always makes it right. How do we know as a church if we are hitting the mark? if we are loving others well, if we are unified. Well, the Bible says they will know us by our... There you go. They will know us by our love. We loved well two weeks ago, right here in this church. We had uh, 236... I'm getting broken up. We had 236 kids sign up for VBS from 24 churches right here. And we love those kids well. <clears throat> and I can tell you, those kids, when they're 25 or they're 30, they may not remember the scripture verse of the week. <laughs> they may not even remember the theme but one thing they will know is they were loved well. You guys did that. This church was in a place that was hitting on all cylinders two weeks ago. That's the church that this country needs. Do you agree? It's not about what we know. It's about how well we love. And that's what Paul is saying. Let's get away from the statistics. 
Let's get to doing the things that are important. Loving our kids well. Showing the world that we love them no matter what. And we can do that. I think history will prove that the more we love, the more the gospel will be shared. The more people will know about him, will follow him, and know him well. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we desperately need you. I just pray that, Father, that we would step down from any pride that we would have and any accomplishments that we have. That we would give ourselves completely and 100% over to you. Spend time hearing your voice. Spend time listening to your voice in quiet this world is just so busy and I know I fall into that trap myself all the time but Lord you know when it's just me and you your sweet voice speaks so loudly and I pray that for every single person within the sound of my voice whether online or sitting here today that you would run after them this week. That you would chase them down and get them to a place where they can be quiet long enough to hear your voice. That still small voice. And I know that you will, in that moment, be the Jesus that I know. And you will speak loudly in that moment. Pray that for all of us, Lord. And I pray that we go today with a peace knowing, Lord, that we have loved well here. And that we will continue to love well as it is our goal. In this we pray, amen. Amen. All right. sing a song. Um, all the people said amen. 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 All right, Kai is going to lead us in this one.
we're all broken, but we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and fall. And He so loved the world, He sent His Son to save us all. And all the people said, Amen. Whoa. Let's take the light of Christ in the world. Thank you so much. We will see you next week. And all the people said? Amen. All right. And all the people said amen. Oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen.